Welcome to Regenerated Radio, Season 4, Episode 3, this this week, this episode, this thing. We're talking about ecclesiology and why it matters. Uh, what is good ecclesiology? What is bad ecclesiology? What are the good benefits of having uh, biblical ecclesiology and the way that we structure the church? And so these are the things that we want to talk about. And that's kind of come up, uh, if you've been listening the past couple of episodes, both the conversation that I had with Wes and the conversation that I had with Lawson. Uh, we both kind of brought up the fact that uh, it's, it's good to be reformed entirely, right? And it, that seeps down into the way that you understand the church to function, the way that you understand the church to run. And so uh, our goal today is to just talk about ecclesiology, why it matters, what is good biblical polity, and then kind of what brought us to our particular conclusions. And we hope that that can be a blessing to you guys. So without further ado, let me bring in Wes and Lawson. Welcome, guys. Good to see you guys. Good to see you, man. All three of us are here. Yes, we are all here. It's amazing. It's Last. the first time. Can this episode be called, We're All Finally yeah, Back? We're or all We're back. All So Back? We're All So Back. Thing. Yeah, we're all so <laughs> back. Also, also back. All right. <laughs> well, let's just jump right into it. Uh, we've had plenty of banter before the proper start of this. So uh, let's jump right into our questions. I want to ask you guys, I mean, I mentioned it a couple of times already. I think I hinted at the definition. But if anyone wants to take a shot at just kind of defining ecclesiology for us, because uh, I know that a lot of people within our churches are going to be listening to this. And it's, you know, um, I, I certainly know that there are people within my church who won't really have any idea of what I mean when I say the word ecclesiology. Uh, and so can we define that uh, if anyone wants to take a shot at it? Yeah, I mean, just the etymology of it, you know, the ecclesia and then ology, the study of the ecclesia, the gathering, uh, not not just the study of it, but when we're talking about like, if if this is even a proper term, ecclesiology proper, uh, it's how, how does the church exist in a biblical form? How does it work? What does it look like? How does it function? What are the different roles within it, et cetera, et cetera. I think that, I mean, that's how I break down these, you know, these doctrines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah. wouldn't make, I wouldn't make any addendum to that. I mean, the major thing is when you're thinking about it from as precise as we can be, it's what, do, what do we believe about the church? What do we believe about how it functions? How is it governed? How do we observe its ordinances? The list goes on. But I mean, it really is the where the rubber meets the road of pretty much all of our theology. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's so many different aspects of it, of course, and we can talk about a few of them today. We're probably not going to hit all of it in this one episode, uh, but certainly I'd like for us to get to sort of the main understanding of how we, we see the church, um, how we see its function, how we see its... Um, it's it, the ordinances, the offices of the church. There's so many things that go into actually a full, robust ecclesiology that, you know, it's hard to just say, well, here's this one topic and we take it all at once. Uh, you know, you have entire books written on ecclesiology. I've got books sitting over here right now on polity uh, that just discuss the officers of the church. And that doesn't even involve, like, what does it mean to be a, a member of a local church? What does it mean to be brought into this this covenant body? And what do we even mean by covenant body? Has that something to do with, uh, you know, covenant theology? Or how, how do we tie all these together? I think it's a really, uh, it's a big topic. And so it's hard for us to say just like, we're going to talk about one thing. But I think really, the main thing we'll talk about today is kind of where, how we got to where we are uh, with those particular or with our particular understanding of ecclesiology uh, or maybe the first question we should ask to get to this is what do we think is the correct form of ecclesiology uh, I think we're all kind of on the same page here uh, I would hope so uh, but if you guys want to expound on that a little bit Lawson I think we we've, we've discussed this idea of being elder led and congregational rule maybe you can expound that for us a little bit and explain what that means yeah, for sure. So the, the aim for elder-led and congregational ruled is to is to give appropriate weights and measures to, um, to to both the offices of elder and the weight of the congregation. And I think that you can fall into two real ditches there. You know, the first is an overemphasis on the office of elder, where it is essentially a tyrannical rule. I mean, and and you know, understanding that the Bible does very clearly call us to submit to our elders. Um, and that language finds it, it's the same language that we find in regard to wives submit to your husbands, but in the midst of that, like there isn't a there isn't a taking of authority in the sense of I'm going to tyrannically rule over the people the same way that you don't tyrannically rule over your wife, and so instead it's, it gives recognition to the weight of the congregation and its voice. And really, I, I would say one of the major things that it that it um, that it pays close attention to is the priesthood of all believers. There's a recognition that the elder doesn't possess a, a 
an extra endowment of the Spirit of God over and against the rest of the congregation. And so we, we, we appeal to the congregation regularly. We appeal to the congregation for major decisions. We want to hear their voices. But nonetheless, we don't neglect the actual role of leading. And so an elder-led model is one that says, hey, the elder does have responsibility and weight and authority that should be uh, recognized and the people should submit to the elders. They should heed their counsel. They should trust their leadership. But at the very same time, it doesn't create a dynamic of the elder's word is the final word. It's that the congregation's word is the final is the final word. And so what we want to do is give equal weights and measures to both of those. The elder is leading. The congregation is the loudest and clearest voice uh, for the for the ruling of the church. Yeah, I, I, I definitely would agree with that. I have the um, what comes to my mind immediately is, of course, uh, the passage in Ephesians uh, Ephesians 4, right? Chapter 11, or not chapter, verse 11, where you have, he gave him some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And what's the purpose, right? It's for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the son of God to a perfect man, to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. And so the, these men, these pastors and teachers in particular, in this case, are given really a task that uh, is, has an implied authority to it, uh, even within the very the, the very uh, language that's used. You know, one of the things that we saw in the SBC last year was Tom Askell put forth the resolution um, to, to basically, what, what, how would you say, equivocate all of that language of pastor, elder, teacher, um, bishop, bring all those things together under one term, a term, which of course we've all, as Baptists, we've believed that for a long time, but now to kind of codify that was a good thing. Although of course there's all there's the discussion of whether or not the way that we went about it was correct, but that's a, a discussion for another day, probably. Um, but just the understanding that, yeah, there's, there's a real spiritual authority that these men have by virtue of being put into a position where they're supposed to, to teach and to equip. So uh, Wes, you want to spin off that? Yeah, you know, for me, I look at First Corinthians five as such a good. It's an un, it's an unfortunate um, yeah. example, but it's a good example of how we see this church func. You know how the church functions. Um, you know, you guys talked about it a little bit in the last episode, but uh, the the whole aspect of being elder led, congregationally ruled. Um, I just immediately think about Paul telling the church in Corinth, Hey, I've already cast my judgment on this man. You know, I, I think that you need to deliver him over to Satan, you know, and, uh, but still telling them, you know, you guys are your own church. And this is the Wesley standard version. Like this isn't word for it. You guys are your own church and you all are going to have to figure out how to deal with this guy. And just seeing Paul, with all of the apostolic authority that that guy was given by the Lord, still look at the the local church and say, you all have to meet and figure out what you all believe is the best fit for this situation and this disciplinary situation. But outside of, you know, scripture, I, I immediately think of Ephesians four. Um, it is something that we say weekly on Sunday mornings here at Emmanuel is, Hey, we are here to equip you, uh, mm -hmm. for everything that mm -hmm. pertains to life and godliness with the scriptures. And we're here to edify you. We're here to, to, to build each other up. We're here to listen to the word, not only be equipped with it, but actually put it into action. But one fascinating thing to me is just the plethora of different ecclesiologies i guess and some people would say well you know we don't do the whole ecclesiology th it's like the no creed but christ thing it's no ecclesiology yeah. but christ thing it's like no you have an ecclesiology right it's just tyranny you know what i mean it's just or anarchy it's not tyranny it's just anarchy you know and i think one of the encouraging things all three of us are sbc pastors is a we've been forced to talk about ecclesiology so much and what a what a blessing you know as much as I don't want to see Al Moeller go up and argue with, uh, and I just forgot his name. Who, who Rick in the Warren. world? Saddlebacks Rick guy. Warren. Rick, yeah. Warren. Rick Warren. I can't believe I forgot his name. <laughs> but what you know, obviously none of us want to sit there. Maybe we do, and watch Al argue with Rick Warren over all this nonsense. But the fact that we're having to do this is good. Yeah. You know, 
And that just goes to show you how important ecclesiology really is. And it really can make or break your congregation. And you want to talk about some of the most strict, um, strict or just staunch and harshly worded scriptures uh, are the ones talking about how God's church, how his bride should be handled, should be governed. Uh, even going back to the Old Testament and you start pulling out some of these regulative principle um, scriptures on how the church should be ran, maybe not, you know, specific to ecclesiology, but you start looking at these things. Uh, and what comes to my mind is when Samuel was talking to Saul, you know, and he says, your, or he says, the sin of rebellion is, uh, is as idolatry, you know, and then he takes it a step forward and condemns him for worshiping the Lord presumptuously. It's like, hey, you've presumed, you know, how God should be worshiped. And so I think, I think ecclesiology should be taken very serious because, I mean, how dare we be presumptuous on how the Lord of heaven and earth wants to be worshiped and how his church should be governed? Yeah, that's actually a really good point because uh, <clears throat> I think that we see a lot of times, uh, you know, we're very quick to talk about the regulative principle, especially as Baptists. I mean, I've been going around on Sunday nights with my church discussing what is biblical worship and kind of grounding it in this idea. Well, we're talking about biblical worship. What What is God commanded? How has he established his church and how has he commanded that his church is to be carried out? And so when we're looking at, um, you know, the arguments, for example, we're kind of transitioning, I guess, into this idea of like, what's the biblical form of ecclesiology? But we want to make sure that everything that we're doing is grounded in the scriptures. You know, so what you brought up was a, a good a good point um, with with Paul just giving authority, really, even though he has fully, obviously, the apostolic authority to say this is what I, I think needs to happen. Uh, the the congregation is charged to actually carry out those things under their own authority, and so we really have a, a biblical precedent for this idea of the congregation having. Uh, a voice, you know, um, even though there's also the, the the balance given with all these other things. And uh, I do think that, you know, we consider, sorry, children, uh, um, I do think we consider, uh, you know, you have what you're mentioning with Al Mohler and Rick Warren, you know, this is, it's the, do we want to listen to those people? I do enjoy listening to Al Mohler argue with people sometimes, just to be honest with you, but <laughs> uh, I want to bring that up. But, but uh, no, to your point, though, I think that we really should uh, it's it's worthy of discussion, I guess is all I'm saying. Because what what ends up happening is uh, if you don't think through your ecclesiology, what it, what ends up what ends up happening is it trickles down to the church and it brings up drama and problems within the church and the the way that the the congregation interacts with the elders and the way the elders inter interact with the congregation starts to get corrupted and starts to uh, to cause issues. And uh, we need to we need to make sure that we're doing this in the correct way. So. Um, I, I guess I can kind of transition. Can, I, can I jump in and add something really quickly? Yeah, please do. Yeah. yeah so one of the things that, that Wes brought up that's really helpful here is the way that we think about the congregation is going to be dramatically impacted by our ecclesiology um, and also the way that we equip the congregation. So like when we're thinking about the concept of elder led congregationally ruled, you know, I, I really think for an extended period of time, the congregation has been perceived and, and really functioned as an audience. Um, and when you're equipping an audience, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you equip an audience. They're literally there to watch. They serve no real purpose past that. But, you know, one of the things that I think Baptist ecclesiology really does emphasize, and appropriately so, um, you know, Wes, you brought up Ephesians 4. We're aiming to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Our presupposition is that the congregation is there to be equipped to do ministry, to actually serve not only inside the life of the church, but also serve as ministers and priests out in the world, right? And so. Um, one of the one of the keynote parts, one of one of the maybe the the fountainheads of our ecclesiology is what we believe about the people of God. We believe that they are to be equipped for the work of the ministry. We believe they are to be guarding the doctrine of the church. You know, certainly that's given to the elders, but it's not isolated to the elders. There's a reason that we would say, hey, we, we want people to understand the doctrine of our local church, not just so that they can give a statement on it, but so they can give a defense to it. And so, like, the way that we think about the congregation is going to directly inform the way that we form our ecclesiology. And so when we think about them as, as not only these, like, people who are there to hear as if just being present is, is the goal, um, and instead think of them as a congregation of people of God that are being formed into the image of Christ and equipped for the work of the ministry, that, that is going to heavily influence the way that we 
um, the way that we form uh, the the governance or polity right of our churches. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that's really helpful. Um, so, is there anything specifically that brought you guys to the conclusions that you're at regarding ecclesiology, regarding particularly this idea of congregational um, congregational ruled and then elder led, but also, I mean, like, uh, I guess I'll maybe even speak to that a little bit. My, uh, just thinking through, not not just particularly that, uh, but even the the congregationalism aspect of it. You know, we we understand that each uh, one of our churches, you know, the three of us, we're we're all Southern Baptist churches, but we're not under a denomination. The Southern Baptist Convention can't even properly be called a denomination, really, if we're being technical, right? We're an association of autonomous churches. That autonomy is an important part of it that I think that we haven't really touched on too much yet. Uh, I don't want, I know that we're, we're kind of going down a different path from it, but um, I think I've just, I've seen that as really one of the defining features of why I've moved away. And again, that's another thing, conversation to have, why I moved away from sort of the Presbyterian model. Although I guess I never really fully bought into it, but that's another conversation for another day. Uh, but the congregational model just makes so much more sense because the autonomy of the local church, I think, is just clear within scripture. Uh, and in, not just clear within what we saw, like we mentioned with Paul and, and his um, his injunctions to the Corinthian church and other places as well. But I think it's just clear from the very aspect of what, what we see with the concept of, of the, the universal, the invisible church versus this, this idea of the visible local church. Uh, and the way that those two things interact, and to me, I've, I've always sort of had a, a big em emphasis whenever I'm talking about baptism, the Lord's Supper, we talk about, I mean, in a lot of places, really what, what you're seeing is this key distinction between the invisible and the visible. And so whenever I look at it, um, the, the, the case for an autonomous local church being led by elders and ruled by the congregation, I think is so, is so correct biblically um, because of that very distinction. You know, we look and we see this idea of a broader body, a universal church of some sort. Uh, of course, we have differing opinions on some of these things, even throughout the, the three of us. But uh, we have that, that broader idea, but represented within that are these visible local assemblies. Uh, and yeah, so I don't know. You can, Lawson, you may want to speak to that because you don't know, have the full agreement. But I don't know. No, do you have a you. different, I'm, I'm maybe a better, a better question is, do you have a, a, a different understanding of like how you come to this conclusion that autonomy of the local church is really important. Uh, one of the, and my, my journey might be a little bit different there. Um, for, for one reason is I, I served in a, in a congregation that had split off into satellite campuses. Um, and I, I can't tell you how much I learned during that era. Um, it was, it was, a, a, a there are better ways to learn it. I'll say that. Um, <laughs> But in but in that period of time where I was learning that the importance of an autonomous congregation is is one if you're going to remove the if you're going to remove the, the center of power from the congregation into some third party you're playing a really dangerous game right uh, and you're playing a dangerous game for a number of reasons uh, I think we even see this to some degree in the Southern Baptist Convention that is not a denomination though often functions like a denomination which yeah. is problematic um, it, it should function as a convention. It should function as an association, but oftentimes I think it gets a little too big for its britches. Um, but, but in that, I think what we're looking at is the congregation traditionally are, are the best guardians of the church. Mm -hmm. Um, elders most certainly are, they're given that, but, but you get a congregation of people that are zealous for the truth of the Bible. They don't fold like academics do. Um, like as you go higher and higher up, traditionally, that's how you watch liberalism and false doctrine begin to creep into the church. You don't get that at the laity, primarily because you have people who just read their Bibles and live their life. And amazingly, that's sufficient. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, I think that that's one reason. The other is as you begin to, to divert power away and you're, in, I think, introducing, a, a third office. You have to introduce a third office. I'm a two office guy. I, I, I assume that we're all two office guys. Okay. So yeah, I think the introduction of a third office is going to be a, a huge problem in and of itself because you've invented an office that God didn't give us. Um, and so because there aren't qualifications specifically attached to it, you're going to introduce other things. And I, I just think that's a dangerous endeavor. And so it, it's taking the authority, it's placing it elsewhere. They're not going to be as good of an oversight as the elders of a congregation, the deacons, and then most importantly, the congregation itself. The moment you introduce something else, you're going to have major issues. And primarily because you're going to have a guy at the top, no matter where you are, you're going to have a guy at the top and he's going to function as a bishop or he's going to function as a pope. And I assure you, like, none of us need that. 
Yeah. I don't want that. We're already predisposed to to pride. The last thing that anybody needs is a third office that supersedes all others. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, well, I think to that to that end, then that's a good transition. I think into the question of what is the appropriate balance then between the leadership of the elders uh, and their their sort of authority that they've been given by God, um, and the, the congregation's voice as as the final sort of the final authority. Um, you know, there's a spiritual authority that the elders have, but of course the congregation has the final say in a lot of matters of practice in the church. So what's a good balance there? Because that seems like it's almost contradictory at first. Yeah, I, so I'm pretty sure I ripped this off of someone, but I added to it. Um, I'm, I'm a two office guy. I think it's a stretch. Um, I'll just, I'll just come out and say, I think it's a stretch to come up with any more offices other yeah. than, elder overseer bishop slash slash whatever whatever we want to call them pastors um and deacon right i i just those are explicit you know instructions by the lord and his word um <clears throat> pardon me but i think the balance is this and I, I it may have been a nine marks thing uh that explained it this way but you know the the elder is the steering wheel I mean, we really steer the car. We we don't we basically decide the direction. Uh, we don't decide it. We prayer, fasting, scripture, your your spiritual disciplines, you know. And you're we are seeking this not an audience like Lawson rightly pointed out, but this this fold of sheep that God has entrusted to us. And we are steering this 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 car. Hey, we need to eat the grass over here because we trampled it too much over here. And I know that it's fun over there and it has a good a good view. But if you stay there too long, you're going to trample the grass dead, and you're not going to have any food there, any nourishment there. It's actually going to you know cause you know bacterial infections. And just looking at this sheep, you know imagery, and we kind of steer the sheep. Hey, we need to go over here. And we need to go over here. And then thinking about us as the steering wheel, you look at the congregation as the gas pedal and the brake pedal, you know, they're, they're okay. We're going to go there. You know, we're, we, th our leader has told us to go left at 50 degrees and we're going to go there. Or, uh, your, your elders have said, Hey, we're going to go left at 50 degrees and you have 40 to 5,000 people say, no, 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 no. No, we, we do not need to go over there. And the balance is this is just because we're an elder doesn't mean we have some mystical power to always make the correct decision. I mean, praise God for congregants, right? I mean, seriously. Yeah. Uh, so the, the second office that we, we throw in there, and this is where I can't remember who did it, but they left deacons out of this is I've always put deacons in there as kind of the, the, the heat and AC. You know, they're there to serve the, the, those inside that car, those who are steering, those who are pushing the gas pedal. Now, here's the fascinating thing. I always try to communicate, you know, I've been here about three years now. And when I got brought in here, I communicated to them. I'm a church member here first. I, I'm a member here first. I'm not just an elder. I'm not just one of your pastors. I'm a church member here. And I, I too care about this church in the same way as you are. We're going to help serve this church, not just in a, a preaching method, but hopefully we'll make food at potlucks and we'll go see the orphans and widows and all of those things. But you kind of look at that balance and here's what you find out is that your elders also vote. Uh, your deacons also vote. Your parishioners also vote. Uh, there's, if you escape this, uh, this um, I can't even think of the word. If you escape this method of church government, there's there's always a big hole somewhere of these checks and balances. And as Lawson used Proverbs twenty, verse ten, you know these unequal weights and unequal measures in how we uh, govern the church. Now, that's not to say that sinners aren't present. That's not to say that there's not Baptist churches who have gone off the deep end, right? Of course, there's Baptist churches who have gone off the deep end. Yeah. Um, 
here in here in Eastern Kentucky right now, First Baptist Church Moorhead has two gay affirming pastors, and one of them is gay, living with his boyfriend. You know, and that's a that's a former SBC church that's a First Baptist church. I'm not I'm not saying that we're not going to end up like the PCA, right? That's not what I'm saying. Uh, and I just wanted to quote this. This is uh, chapter 26 of the 1689. Uh, paragraph three, I cannot tell you guys how much I wear this chapter out as a pastor. The purest churches under heaven are subject to mixture and air. And some have so degenerated as to become no churches of Christ, but synagogues of Satan. Nevertheless, Christ has always had and ever shall have a kingdom in this world to the end thereof of such as believe in him and make profession of his name. In other words, just because pure Baptist ecclesiology, like actual Baptist ecclesiology, not the 21st century, you know, faux ecclesiology is imperfect. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means sinners are taking part in it. Right. You know, so. Yeah, that's a really helpful way of putting that. Uh, and that's something that I think that a lot of people will criticize the the congregational model for right it's just that there's well look at all the the potential pitfalls within it yeah and really one more, go ahead. one more thing guys lawson brought this up that there's a lot of there's a lot of grace there's a lot of mercy but there's also a lot of wisdom in letting the congregation vote and it works right mm -hmm. um baptists are the only one who only let saved people make decisions true story we're yeah. the only ones Every now, now here's the thing. I can't separate the wheat and the tares. I'm not supposed to separate the wheat and the tares. But when you are, when you profess to know Christ and are obedient to Him through baptism, and you join a local church, um, yes, you're part of the universal church. Of, of course, nobody's denying that. But and you know, hopefully today or in one of these following episodes, we'll get into the difference between the local ecclesia and the, you know. And why it's kind of obvious that those two categories exist in scripture, but we're the, we're the only ones who say, no, you got to be a believer to raise your hand here. You, you have to, uh, and we're the only ones who only allow believers to join our church. That's a prerequisite to become in this covenant relationship with us is you have to know Christ. Yeah. 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 And that's, I mean, this is where it starts to, we can start to kind of diverge into the, the, the messy area of this because certainly mm -hmm. it is messy. It's going to be messy. And, and you brought up a good point. And the reason that it becomes messy is because of, of sin. Uh, and unfortunately we are all a bunch of wretched um, uh, individuals still, although we've been redeemed and transformed by Christ. Uh, but then, then again, that is part of the problem, right? What if, what if we have, say, for example, you come into a situation at a, at a church where you've, you've entered into a place uh, as the pastor now, and you have a congregation that has not in the past, for whatever reason, done its diligence to make sure that it is there is, in fact, regenerate church membership, that the, the core body of people that are making up your church membership roles are and have there has been some discernment practiced on whether or not these people actually do or have made a profession of faith or if they are walking in that profession of faith. I mean, this is where church discipline comes in, and uh, it's, it's so important. Right? If we're not able to follow through on that practice of church discipline to recognize that somebody is not, they're walking not in accordance with the profession of their faith, but rather they're continuing in a pattern of sin. And the pastors have not addressed that. The pastors in the past, you know, previous people, whatever the case may be, have not ever actually taken that person aside and walked through the process of discipline with them to call them to repentance or ultimately to hand them over to Satan and to remove them from the membership roles. That is such an important aspect of this because as you say, yes, I mean, that chapter in chapter three or that paragraph in chapter 26 is so important to recognize that we are subject to mixture and error. Uh, and yet the, the ideal and the, um, the, the standard really is purity. And I think we see that all throughout scripture, really, the standard for uh, covenant membership uh, in any regard. And you go back to that visible, invisible thing, but the visible covenanted body of the church, uh, the standard is that they would be pure. And so and this is why Paul would tell uh, the Corinthian church to remove the leaven, remo um, you know, remove the evil person from among you. 
And uh, I think it's such an important aspect of this that we miss so often. And I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with the idea of church discipline. A lot of people in the laity in particular, they think of this idea, well, it's just horrible, like casting this person out. It's just exclusionary. It's terrible. And that's, that's kind of a modern American mindset, I think, partly. Um, but the reason that it's so important is that you don't want those people who who are um, not, if they if they are in fact, regenerate, they're not walking in their, in, uh, according to their profession. And if they're not walking according to their profession or just they're straight up not regenerate, then you don't want those people taking part in your decision-making process at the church. So as we're getting into these messy situations, like this is part of it. We have to understand how important church discipline is uh, to this whole process. So, Yeah, too Two major thoughts there on church discipline. Um, so first of all, like church, I, I want to be careful about church discipline. I, I, probably all of us have read at one point uh, Dever's book, right? Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. At bare minimum, it was probably our introduction to uh, like reforming ecclesiology. He has a chapter in there called Don't Do Church Discipline. Uh, I didn't read that section and I wish I would have. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because we... There's, there's obviously a name. Like if we're going to give a defense, uh, it's so important uh, of if we're going to give a defense of regenerate church membership, but we're not going to practice church discipline, we don't really care about uh, regenerate church membership. Right. Um, like if you're not, if you're not going to actually guard the flock in the midst of them being members, then then just open the gate. Like it's fine. Just let them in. And so because we care about the the membership of our church, because we want them to be vitally you know, connected to Christ, walking with them and being faithful, and we want them to uphold the doctrine, we want them to live faithfully, we want them to just genuinely maintain and live the Christian life. Um, so so due to that, we, we practice church discipline and we want to see them flourish. But something I'll, I'll say on that that I think we often overlook in regard to the messiness of, of, of aiming to have of a good solid ecclesiology and regenerate membership. I, I tell, I told our congregation a couple of, uh, a couple of years ago that it, I, I'll believe that we believe in church discipline when we uphold it from another congregation. Hmm. Um, and, and, you know, Greg, I've, I've talked to you about this a, a little bit in the past. It's like, we've had three or four cases of people showing up at our door who were disfellowshipped, excommunicated, whatever term you'd like to use. Um, from other congregations, but part of being Baptist and part of upholding church discipline is that you're willing to uphold it from the congregation down the road. Um, as you know, for instance, maybe somebody who's very wealthy is making their way into their, your congregation. They've snuck in, perhaps they didn't give you the information. And now you've got, you're sitting there looking at a seemingly a problem. You've got a man who's been disfellowshipped and how are you going to uphold this? Are you going to tell them they can't even attend? Like, what are you going to do to uphold those things? And so I think something that's really important and, 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 and worthwhile having a conversation about, especially in this situation of the messy, is you as a Baptist church have to uphold, frankly, the messy situations that took place in previous congregations if you care about ecclesiology and more than just your own local body, but really the association as well, um, and for the sake of protecting your own flock. And so in, anyway, in regard to church discipline, I think you've got to be able to uphold it from other congregations as well, not just say, okay, we've made a verdict here, but, but upholding the verdict of another like-minded congregation. Yeah. And the vice versa is true. Mm -hmm. um, if if you have disfellowshipped someone or, you know, thankfully in the past three years, everyone who was under church discipline here, not not a ton of people, um, hopefully not a ton of people, right? Um, but they, they pretty much they execute the third step on their own, you know? And I think that you guys would right. probably agree that's that's normally what happens is yeah. they remove themselves. But when you yeah. get that membership letter for that person, do you just sign it and send it back to the church and say, yeah, you know, um, they're in good standing at, at my church? Or do you have the hard conversation down the road and do you call and warn that fold of sheep that there is an issue here and that there's been patterns of X, Y, Z where this sin was present and, you know, they had a refusal to, to repent. So I think it works both ways. Um, are you going to honor it from another congregation, right? If, if the congregation truly does hold the keys to the kingdom, are you going to honor that or, or also are you going to honor it so much that you're going to help, out the other congregations when you have to practice it 
and it escalates to the third and final point. Are you willing to stick your neck out there and actually care for not just your little kingdom here, but the kingdom made up of other local churches? Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, unfortunately, a, a big part of the problem with this whole conversation is that, I mean, I've had eight new members come into the church in the last year or so. Um, maybe a little more than that. Humble anyway. brag. Humble yeah, brag. I know, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> huge, right? Anyway, <laughs> but every time I call one of these people, uh, and they're not one of these people, but when they call their previous church, I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. Like, I, I'll get the most confused reactions from the pastor. The, the why are pastor. you calling me? <laughs> what, do you, what do you want? Like, why? Are you yeah, pastor? dude, they left. We get it. All right. Jeez. Exactly. It's just a strange thing. Uh, and so it's really unfortunate that like this, and, you know, I kind of can expect it from a, a non-denominational church or I kind of expect it from a Presbyterian church, but like when maybe, but when it comes to, uh, you know, another Southern Baptist church, I, I expect that there's at least been some conversation there. Uh, and unfortunately that's not always the case. And so I would just say that like, if you're a pastor at a church, you're listening to this and it's not something you've considered, uh, I would plead with you to be in those conversations because really it does it does take that associationalism it does take that back and forth conversation to make sure that everyone is having this. I mean, I really one of the only um, major things that's happened here. I won't go into the details, but uh, was a church discipline situation where there was somebody in our church who was under discipline somewhere else. And this is from before that I before I even got there, and there was all these conversations that swirled around it. And what, what ended up happening? Uh, I don't know. The, the kind of end result of it was that. Uh, we just had to work out uh, the, uh, those those conversations that should have happened beforehand, po uh, post facto, right? And th that's never good. Uh, it just makes it really messy and difficult. So, uh, can I ask you think? Oh, look, go ahead, Wes, Wes. No, you go, you go, Wes. So, he Hebrews thirteen seventeen, right? Uh, obey, submit to your elders, um, for they are keeping watch over your soul mm -hmm. as those who will give an account to the Lord. Sometimes I really don't think that uh, pastors believe that. Yeah. I am I mean, seriously, like, I just don't think we believe it sometimes. Or um, we believe it. We believe it in a way to say that, well, we, we we have the authority because we have the account over your soul, but we don't believe it in the, in the, oh, yeah, in yeah, the yeah, negative yeah. side of that, right? Like, we want to keep the authority, but we don't want to have the accountability because really, yeah, ultimately, yeah. that's... That's yeah, we want we that. want we want the last part of the verse. You know, let yeah. them do this with joy and without groaning. Right? We, right. hey guys, you know, you guys should let me do this joyfully. But I mean, generally, if we really believe that Susie Q, who you know left our church in a sinful situation, um, that we're going to have to stand before God and give an account for her soul, and then when she leaves our congregation, we're like, oh. You know, thank God she's gone. I mean, and then we get that letter in the mail from Second Baptist Church down the road. Yeah. And it's like, oh, man, they're hers now. You know, get the pen out and sign real quick because yeah. it's like, no, 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 no. You're still going to have to give an account to the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, it's and so I don't know that that's convicting for my life because it's like I think we've all been in situations where we needed to be reminded, hey, you're going to have to give an account to the Lord, you know, and yeah. Yeah. Well, let's shift kind of away from the church discipline conversation because I think Can I ask one more thing. I, I actually think that people would be intrigued by the answer to this. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. I've got to. So just out of curiosity, somebody knocks on your door. Let me rephrase. Somebody shows up on Sunday morning and they begin to attend. As they begin to attend, you get information from church down the road that they were disfellowshipped from their previous congregation. The reason I'm asking this is because my opinion has changed in the last two years about this. So someone's been disfellowshipped from Second Baptist Church down the road, right? They show up at yours. Let's just assume you're First Baptist, though. I don't think you've – sorry. Um, and they begin to attend. You find out they were disfellowshipped. Do you allow them to continue to attend, or do you think that disfellowshipping actually requires an actual cutting off of fellowship? Hmm. I would say it depends on the situation. Yep. Honestly, okay. I, I would be in conversation with the pastors. If there's If there's a – disciplinary issue that where it actually puts my congregation in danger uh then i think that that's a, a problem uh you know somebody's just fellowship because of some sexual sin that has occurred uh, i think that that's a conversation that ought to be had with the pastor down the road that, that they're coming from and that you should know um but uh, on principle you know for, for your question just on principle I don't, I don't think that i would stop them from attending necessarily uh but those are you know very deliberate conversations that have to be had at that point sure. 
you know, hey, okay. I've talked with your pastor down the road. I understand that you're under church discipline there. You're welcome to continue to attending here, but only as a as a part of your seeking reconciliation with the previous church. And no. I, I don't know. That's just a, I think that's the first place that I would go. I don't to. have a clue. I never thought about that. Yeah. I mean, I, that just, I experienced it. And so my, yeah, yeah, my I, opinion has kind of changed. I was just curious where y'all were on that. Yeah. I've never thought about it. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that, I don't know. I think I'm fairly confident in that. That was really just kind of spun off the top of my head, but I hope that, you know, I think that's where I would go at first. Uh, anyway, good question. So moving away really quickly from this church discipline conversation, because I do want to get into the other messy part of this, right? So, the, I think one of the criticisms that comes up a lot, essentially, is that, well, if you allow the congregation, if the congregation has authority, the final say, they're, they're, everyone has an equal say as far as voting on things, um, doesn't that cause drama? Doesn't that like have a tendency to uh, divide and cause factions among you and all of those sorts of things? I don't know. What would you guys say to that? Or how do you deal with it? Who's going, Wes? You lean forward. I'll answer. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'll am I'm. tell you that I'm in an interesting situation. And the reason I'm in an interesting situation is because we planted the yeah. church that, that I pastor. So um, the reason that's interesting is because most people, because of the way that we emphasized our polity, really lean very, they lean heavily on the, on the elders. And if the elders make a recommendation, normally they're going to vote yes behind it. We're going to have ample conversations and we're going to give them opportunity to like, like this week we're, presenting uh, edits to our constitution and bylaws, right? So those are like, everybody freaks out the moment that we're ever going to do this. Like when I tell other pastors that we're changing our constitution, most of them, their chest gets tight. We've done it like 36 times. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, like I wrote them, I messed them up round one, I messed them up round two, and we're just, you know, we're going to keep fixing them until they're perfect or as close, to, as, as, close as we can get. So we're going to give three opportunities for the congregation to be able to ask questions, to be able to talk through those things. But at the end of the day, the way that we emphasize voting is if you vote yes, praise the Lord. If you vote no, praise the Lord. But whoever w wins, if I can use that term, whatever the vote turns out to be, you need to make the assumption that God has spoken through the voice of the congregation. Yeah. And so like I, I tell I tell our elders or, you know, this was a conversation we had early on where if there's an elder vote um, and I'm really dogmatic about something, I'm like, I believe we should do this. And I get outvoted three to one. My presupposition is not that they're stupid. <laughs> and my presupposition is that I was dumb and the Lord protected me from my ignorance. Yeah. Um, and so I think uh, an understanding of the congregational vote as, as a singular voice, which is going to be demonstrated by the elders first and foremost, and then it will be modeled by the congregation. And so if you do that, I think you can preserve some of the messiness of it. In a more established church, I think that you can have greater difficulty there. And I'm, I'm willing to concede that point for sure. Yeah. Lawson, how long has your church plant been established? Like when did you all, how long ago did you constitute? Oh, that's a good question. So we, we con so we, we launched September 10th of 2017. <laughs> and I think our constitution, which we had to make major changes to our constitution because we functioned more inside of a, uh, like it was like a CEO model guy at the top and then a leadership team that was essentially unqualified elders. Um, but so when we constituted, it was uh, maybe a year, year and a half in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So like five, six years or no, seven years. Yeah. So seven, seven years, years is, is we, so about six years we've had our constitution and then we've yeah. made changes throughout the years. Greg, how long has Trinity been around? 42 years. <laughs> 40. Yeah. We're working on 70 here since the late fifties. Yeah. Um, so working on 70 here. I just, the reason I ask that is because. Um, those are two kind of, I don't know, 40 years is an established church. I mean, yeah. I'd call it an established church. Um, but you're looking at Lawson who's, whose church has existed under a decade at this yeah. point. And then you're around 40 years, Greg, and my church is around 70. And, uh, hopefully, you know, who, who knows, but I'll still be alive when this place hits a hundred years old, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but I think the messiness is going to be there, you know? Um, I, I talked about this in chapter 26 of the second London, but I, I have found, so I'm the only elder at my church right now. We have traditionally had multiple. There are no qualified men here right now. Uh, that's why I was hired. You know, um, that's, that's why I moved here. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is, there's just no qualified men right now. 
uh, and there may be qualified men, but the the main qualification of the desire, uh, yeah. you know, they're just not there, right? Sure. So I am currently your CEO pastor. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it, I can, I can guarantee you that my situation is more messy than a plurality of elders that leads yeah. and guides and then has a congregation that votes and confirms or denies that. Because let me give you an example of this. Um, or this is an example. I don't know why I said example, but let, let me explain it this way. Uh, there's one elder here. Um, so my elder meetings are right here. <laughs> right here. You know, I grab my nine marks book over here. I grab my Valley of Vision and I just hope to God that he shows me the right thing to do. Um, and your Bible, right? Bit, there's, there's and your Bible. Of, you want to use Bible. your Bible too, right? Yeah. There's a, yeah. there's a little bit of hyperbole in there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but genuinely, um, as of right now, and prayerfully, it won't be this way. And the sooner the better. Um, in my congregation, when they watch this, they'll understand that. Um, but or they'll they they'll say the same thing. Um, I have no one to consult with when I guide our church at the moment. You know. Now, thankfully, I have some very established men in the faith here who have served as deacons for years and who have served as trustees for years or uh, financial people for our church and all that. But there's the, sometimes I might throw out an idea and the church is like, whoa, do you not read the room? It's like, no, I'm one person, Hmm. you know? But then there's also the fact that I'm in a really vulnerable position at the moment because I have very little accountability of the kind that God has ordained to have. Right. Of course I have 80 to hundred people out here on a Sunday who keep me accountable. Of course I have six active deacons right now who, you know, keep me accountable, but do I have men above reproach who check the boxes that God has ordained who can say, I think you're a little bit prideful here, Wes, or I don't think you're leaning heavy, heavily enough on this or et cetera, et cetera. So, Speaking from my experience right now, I can assure you that it's it's going to be messy regardless because sinners are involved. Yeah. But what God says works, works. Right. True. <laughs> you know, yeah. pra- pragmatism is only bad when we do it. Yeah. Uh, God is pra- the most pragmatic out of all of us. I, that's just who he is. You know, it, what he says and what he ordains works so yeah 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 and to your point like i think that it's interesting too here because uh it's just me and tony here uh, as, as elders in the church and uh what's funny to me is that that's it's kind of always a little bit strange to me to have just two uh i feel like you should have at least three to, so you can have a tiebreaker uh if those situations come up but uh it hasn't been a problem so far you know we've been on the same page and everything so that's been really helpful but uh that's just another one of those things that you want to consider like how do how do those uh, those things play in to figuring out, you know, your elders and, you know, we're trying to identify more, more qualified men, but it's the same kind of situation. You know, uh, there needs to be a desire and there needs to be people who are uh, able to teach. And it's just, those are, those are things that can be in short supply. Um, and I think maybe, I don't know if I want to say this too dogmatically, but I do think some, that's somewhat of a product of our day. Um, we've just become so biblically illiterate uh, as a, as a, culture that it's been really difficult to find people who have the not not just the desire but i mean the ability to teach is really difficult uh another thing i wanted to say was one thing that i think is another place where this starts to get messy that i think we can address just a little bit as we sort of start to wrap up here uh is you know we talked about the congregation having the authority but um that that sometimes starts to play out in these weird ways we didn't really address my initial question was what happens when people start to create factions and how does it it does it breed factiousness does it um does this congregationalism have a, that kind of built into it as a as a feature rather than a bug or uh, i mean i guess a lot of that's answered by sin you know we just need to recognize that it's there if that is a, uh, if that's happening that it's because of sin but i don't know you guys can speak to that son when you when you idolize a green hmm. uh i don't care what you're doing you're going to have factions and but I mean, I, I like to live in reality. 
And the reality of things is, is I'm not going to always agree with everybody. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to agree with either of you all on everything. And we have not gone into this expecting us to agree on everything. I mean, how ignorant would that have been? Like genuinely not being mean, but how ignorant yeah. would that have been? But, but here, here's the thing when you, when you're a peacekeeper instead of a peacemaker, right? Blessed are the peacekeepers, right? Just keep the peace. <laughs> um, it's, you're going to start idolizing things like a green and idolizing things like, Hey, this big hang that we have is more important than being obedient to Christ, man. Disagreeing with people at your job. Doesn't make you leave your job. Disagreeing with the prices at Walmart. Don't make you stop shopping there. Disagreeing with your wife, hopefully does not mean that you're going to divorce her. But for some reason we've created this idol of, of, agreedness and we call it unity, but it's not really, it's just, yeah, we want everybody to agree with us. You're going to have factions and you're going to have quarrels and things like that. But one thing that a congregational church government does is it makes people get used to disagreeing with each other. I, it's just, I mean, that's a very practical way that I've always looked at. It. It's like, guys, you know, we don't have to secret ballot everything, right? Yeah. I mean, I've never gone through that, but it's like, I always think about that. It's like, man, there's some people out there who would just be like, Hey, we should probably secret ballot this. It's like, we're literally voting to just buy a new air conditioner. Like, right. I don't, you know, so I think you're going to have factions because sinners are there and you're going to have quarrels because sinners are there, but it goes right back to church discipline and Hey, we're there to help discipline each other. And, you know, and the reality of the fact is, is 99.9% .9 of church discipline cases you don't see. That's right. Right. Yeah, because, yeah. because hopefully we're repentant, we're bearing fruit and keeping with repentance. So I don't know. It's like, if you idolize, just say, hey, we all got to get along and we all got to, we should all get along, but like, we just have to get along for the sake of getting along. Then of course you're going to have factions. Of course you're going to have quarrels. But I mean, if you really believe that we're here to be molded into the image of Christ, to glorify our God more and more through the decisions we make, I mean, yeah, of course we're going to have disagreements, but I'll live with them here. I got to live with them in eternity. So, yeah, an area in which I'd say that we need to, like, I think there is a preventative here, and I'd, I'd really, the preventative is train your men to be strong men. Like, really, I mean, if you can't have a disagreement and maintain a relationship, you're a very, very weak man. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And and we should be able to train our men to be able to have disagreements. I have a church member that we kind of joke that we will yell at each other from time to time. I mean, it, it really is a joke, but we, we had, we, we have had multiple heated conversations, like not, not angry, not sinful, just like we were zealous for the position that we had. And we talked through it at the end of most of them. We still disagree. Yeah. He's one of the best church members I have. Mm -hmm. um, he's faithful. He serves the Lord. He's, he is, he's studious. He like the reason that he's zealous is because he studies. And he looks and he wants to understand the best decisions to make and the like. And so, like, I think that one of the best things we can do is simply train our men to be good men. And I am specifying men, like, on purpose. Right. Um, <laughs> we, we've really done this thing where men actually are not the head of their household. They're not actually leaders. They're just, like, they're just a, a blob that exists inside of our congregation as opposed to upholding the models that God set up. And so if I can train the men in our congregation to be upright, godly, and and uh, and leaders in their home, then I'm probably going to solve a large amount of the quarrels right there. Um, and then disagree with your church members. Like mm -hmm. if they if they walk up to you and you disagree with them, you don't have to be this like this this guy who's always uh, satisfying every ind every individual's whims. Like have a spine, and if you have a spine and you're going to hold to particular positions, don't don't fall over every time someone pushes back against them. They're going to. Yeah. And more often than not, they actually want the answer. Like as they approach you and ask you a question, I suffered from this really bad early on in the life of our church. Anytime someone asked me a question, it was combative. It wasn't. They just wanted to be informed. They're just and reading so, their Bibles. They're just you know? reading yeah. their Bibles, right? <laughs> just like, doing and, what you will, we exactly. Want them to do. And so I and so I'd bring something up and say, "Hey, what about this?" And and I, I'll never forget. We were about to. We were we were thinking about installing more elders. We already had four at the time. And we were thinking about installing more. And I had a couple of church members walk up to me and say, hey, I've got a question about our process here. 
And in it, I, I pushed back with what we already had established. And then I went home. And as I went home, I thought about the fact that four different members of our congregation walked up to me and said, hey, have you thought about the way that we're doing this? Is it actually what the Bible says? And, and then in my normal everyday Bible reading, I came across Titus where it says appoint elders. And I was like, whoa, maybe I didn't think about our initial, like how we start this process as well as I should have. Mm-hmm. And so like some of it is be open to correction. Don't be prideful. Have a spine and be able to disagree, but be able to disagree with some with some malleability. You should yeah. be able to to heed the voice of your congregation. And as votes go through, you know, you yourself have to maintain the idea that I might get voted down. Like mm-hmm. what I set forward might get voted down. And if it does, it doesn't mean that I failed as a leader. It means that God's system functioned appropriately. Yeah, yeah right. Yep. Well, I think that's probably a good place for us to kind of up, but if there's any other final comments you guys want to mention, on, particularly on this concept that we've been talking about of, of the congregationalism side of it, I mean, there's more that we can talk about with ecclesiology, and we'll continue this conversation next time and maybe take it in a different direction. Uh, but as far as congregational polity and the way that that kind of functions within our churches, uh, is there any final comments you guys want to make before we wrap up? Yeah, uh, baptize believers and let them vote. Yes, <laughs> affirm. Yeah. That's my ecclesiology. I think that's a great ecclesiology. I'll add one because this is one that I I get from a couple of my peers who hold to a different ecclesiology here is their thought is, well, what happens if the congregation um, is abused or the pastors begin to lead inappropriately or something like that? That's that's a normal, I think, uh, qualm with congregationalism. You have congregation and you have the elders and like, what else can we do, right? Who who can we go to? Mm -hmm. It's like, you can go to the 100 plus other members of the congregation and you can you can have a full body of people yeah. waging war against sin and leadership if that happens yeah yeah and yeah. and just one last thing about that my wife came out of the IFB movement I know Greg I've talked to you about that before mm-hmm. but like Hiles Anderson I mean just the whole the whole pure lineage of independent fundamental <laughs> Baptists and I mean they in my opinion they embody the ceo type pastor you know for sure mog the man of god you know don't touch the lord's anointed and things like that um that's not congregationalism Mm -mm. it doesn't work and i understand the Mm -hmm. the thing to say well what about these folks well they're not doing it Mm -hmm. right but you know that's that's not they may call it that but but they're not doing it you know so just to add to what lawson said it's like hey if there is this tyrannical character and this is happening, Hey, God has, God has given you the tools to combat that and don't project those, you know, pseudo forms of congregationalism say, well, see, it doesn't work. It's like, well, that's, that's, it's like Tom Askell talking about theoretical inerrancy. Yeah. It's like, I love that. That's theoretical congregationalism. Right. You know, it's so, yeah, that I just wanted to add that because it's, that's what I get pushed back from most of my my friends who don't hold to, you know, Baptist ecclesiology. It's like, sure. well, look at all these things around here. Yeah, of course. And you can always point out somewhere in every system of anything, like, well, look at this one. That's, well, let's not take the bad apple and, and attribute it to the yeah. whole tree. Uh, the thing that I would say, the final kind of addition that I would say is that um, as pastors in particular, and kind of as an injunction to those uh, who are listening, who may be pastors or maybe elders in their church, um, Trust the congregation, right? I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, Christ is building his church. Like, it's not your church anyway. It does not belong to you. It does not belong to you as a group of elders, even. It belongs to Christ. And he has ordained that these people would be making up that congregation at that time. And so when a decision is being made, that decision, that voice of the congregation is the, the voice of God, honestly. You know, we talk about the Heidelberg Catechism has the, the, um, that phrase that the, the preaching of the word of God is the word of God. Right. And, and, and in the same way, like the decisions that a congregation makes uh, as as an authoritative decision coming together to speak with one voice is the voice of God for that for that church. It's it's the, the decisions that are being made are ordained by him. And so to fight back against them um, is silly. But it also uh, as a, the other, kind of on the flip side of that, we need to be very careful to make sure that the congregation retains its authority um, at either. That, that can have multiple meanings. Either you're making sure that you're not becoming too uh, abusive as as uh, in your way that you're holding authority as a pastor or as a group of elders. Um, 
it can also mean that sometimes you have to talk people down uh, and say, look, you, you've put yourself into a place that's between the congregation and the elders. And there's no position for that within scripture. It's you have elders leading the congregation rules and that's, that's how the church functions. Uh, and so when you do that, you, you may need to have those conversations. And that's, again, kind of come back to that, that process of church discipline if it needs to happen. Um, but be zealous uh, in defending the proper congregationalism because, frankly, your sheep deserve it. They deserve to have the voice um, that, that God has given to them. Uh, and, yeah, that's all I'll say for that. But Yeah, okay. Well, uh, last words. What are we preaching on this Sunday, boys? Ooh. Ooh. Good, awesome. All right, you go. Uh, this is my favorite topic always, by the way. Um, so I'm preaching through Exodus. Just did Exodus 19, where I did the introduction to the Mosaic Covenant. And this week I'm starting um, the Ten Commandments. I'm going to do an introduction to the law, and then I'm doing the first two commandments and why they're not the same commandment, like most people actually function like that. Nice. Because second commandment violations are real. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Pay attention to it. Get your nativity scene out of here. Yeah. There's the word. My wife's the likeness of there. The That's likeness. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. If like it, get it out. Throw it in the dumpster. Hey, we just <laughs> threw ours away in the dumpster. I was so excited. So when a nativity scene comes in my house, this is the yeah. this is actually the banter portion. The nativity <laughs> scene comes in my house. The very okay. first thing I do. Hold on. What? I was going to stop you from bantering. No, 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 I refuse. The nativity <laughs> scene, the nativity scene comes in my house and my mom got us one. The first thing I do is I take the baby out of it and I hand it to Rowan and say, Look a baby. That's what that's all I do. And it's like, here's a new baby for you. This is not a we're not putting this in any position. It's just a toy baby. Take so it Lawson, and go. do you set up the whole nativity scene and just throw away the 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 baby? Uh yes, actually. Nice. Yeah, I'm here for it, honestly. So I, I do. I will say this. I'll give you. I'll give you my one. If it's so, my wife has a pottery set that I'm not like. You can call me inconsistent. That's fine. This is me living at peace and living in an understanding way. Um, where there's a pottery like manger, and there's obviously like a lump inside of the manger. So I'm not. I don't. I'm not. I'm not breaking that. Right. Like I'm gonna leave it be. I'm gonna live at peace. So <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. I, uh, I'm preaching on Genesis chapter six, uh, the latter half of it, where Noah gets the instructions for, uh, building the ark. And, uh, it's, it's such a lovely passage and you consider all the, the typological connections of, uh, you know, move forward into first Peter and, um, all over the place in scripture, you see how many times, uh, this ark is used for deliverance and, uh, as, as a type of Christ. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking about the new covenant uh through the through the ark so that's my that's my goal for the week are you gonna do, do you count moses's ark as an ark yeah okay i was just curious I, among others yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah name, name all the arcs yeah mary Ooh. name them all yeah. <laughs> i don't know yeah, you're, gonna get, you're gonna get into some interesting conversations i'm preaching romans five one through five and i know everybody else Ooh. breaks I, people break it up differently Right, like uh, MacArthur broke it up into like eighteen sermons through eleven verses. I think Askell broke it up in like a five part thing through verse eleven. But I'm just, I'm just going through it, hey guys. I want to rant for a second. Just stop spending nine years in a book of the Bible. Hey, hey, hey! They, hey. they, they don't remember what happened nine years. They don't remember what you talked about. <laughs> you leave nine me years. alone. <laughs> you better be careful. Lawson Terrietto. Lawson is Lawson's about taking half of a verse. Hold on, I'm curious what I did in five. I've got to look it up hey, now. That's not. I read a, I read a song. Preaching. I read a song I, from Romans five. You want me to send it to you? It's good. Yeah, you should send it to him. Be good. Okay, I'm going to uh, to wrap us up because wow. I have to go take my daughter to a flute lesson. So I'm excited for that. But. Uh, for you guys who are watching, thanks for sticking with us through the uh, through the banter and through the fun and uh, and through the hopefully edifying content. And we, we pray that this has been a blessing to you. We pray that this really is edifying and useful to you. If it is, please leave a comment, leave a review, whatever the case uh, may be, anything that you can do that kind of helps us get the word out about the podcast and share it with other people. Uh, we think this is a good resource. It's helpful for us. It gives us a chance to kind of talk and discuss things, but also we want to we pray that it's beneficial for 
the church broadly. Uh, and so we pray that that's the case. And if you guys have any questions or anything, you can re direct those to regeneratedradio at gmail.com or just leave them in comments and reach out to us. All of us are pretty widely available all over the place on social media. So uh, find us and let us know what you need, what kind of questions you have, what kind of things you'd like to see us address. And uh, we'll, we'll attempt to make it through those things. But for now, Lawson, I'm going to steal my brothers and my friends. You guys oh. have a blessed day. <laughs>I ever knew like who like before we ever talked on the phone that day yeah. or tweeted each other I like I listened to one episode of your podcast yeah and then I replied to it like something and you the only thing you said was is the banter okay that's like, all I that, care about that's all you care that's, that's all, all you said about. is is the banter yeah. okay so every you know there's there there are two types of people right there's people who hate fun and there's people who like banter amen and and so like I'm all for <laughs> let's all let's all get in the in the podcast and let's go straight into it. But I do think it's helpful when people realize you're an actual human being and not a robot. Thanks for wearing a collar, Greg. By the way, I know I feel like I should go change. I'm dressed. I'm <laughs> last dressed. week, so last week, I, uh, no, no, yesterday, yesterday when we were supposed to record, I put on a button up like an adult human, right? So I go at, when I realize that we aren't recording. I'm like, I'm not changing clothes. I've already, you know. So I, I go to my normal routine and someone says, why are you wearing a button up? Like I'm wearing a nice button up. Yeah. And I was like, well, I was supposed to be on a video today and I'm not anymore. And they're like, so you just wore it the rest of the day. I'm like, I, I dress nicer yesterday than I do most Sundays. <laughs> don't tell anybody that, but I don't know how I, I feel about you dressing up more nicely for this podcast than for preaching in the pulpit. Well, I don't know. I'm not videoed on, on Sunday. On another note, I did have to ask my father the best way to travel with a suit. You, you know what his response was? Wear it. Yeah, yeah dude, it. I knew he was going to say that. Wear it. That's the so, only way. So Sunday or Friday, I will show up in a full suit. 